So, uh, hello, I want to uh, welcome everybody to the Mysterious Bookshop. Uh, if, you, uh, if you're hiding from anybody, we're video videotaping this, or recording it, or filming it, whatever it's called these days. Um, so, you know, keep your back to the camera, which is over there, otherwise you'll be found out. Uh, I'm Otto Pensler, this is my store, I'm not just a guy here, like, saying hello. Uh, and I'm, I'm honored and, and so proud to have Lisa Unger with us tonight. Uh, I'm always happy to see Lisa, which has been true for quite a long time. But this is even a greater thrill and honor because not only did Lisa write a great book that we're featuring tonight, but I published it. <laughs> Mysterious Press is the publisher of this wonderful Christmas story. Um, as you see, it's a, it's a Christmas book, so I know you think, you know, it's a wonderful little story with kittens <laughs> and a fireplace and, and warm milk and cookies <laughs> while, the, while the little kids wait for Santa Claus and get too tired and have to be taken to bed and so on. You know, but yeah, that's a, almost exactly what this is. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> on the other hand, it's also about... Uh, a young woman who is, owns a bookshop. Uh, I love that we are mysterious. I love any any book with books or bookstores as a background. I think they're just so just an added little fill-up of joy. Um, and she uh, remembers a, a time when she was young, and two of her friends were murdered, and she was brutalized, and uh, was bloody, but survived. Uh, went on with her life and opened a store and had a re had real life. And uh, 10 years later, somebody comes and wants to discover more. The person who committed the crimes, who was convicted of the crimes and went to jail, um, turns out that after he was in jail, several more young women were murdered. So the thought is there was either grave injustice sending this guy to jail, or there's a copycat or something of that sort. Uh, and so he comes to Madeline, Maddie, the, the bookshop owner, and says he wants to learn the truth about this. And possibly he's a, a true crime podcaster, so he would like to solve the crime because it would be great for his podcast. <laughs> and, and Maddie wants nothing to do with this. She wants to bury the past. And that's basically how the story begins. There no kittens, no puppies, <laughs> no warm milk and cookies. <laughs> so, uh, Lisa Unger. So, what, uh, so let me ask you about this. Uh, I have known you now for a while. Yes. And I find you to be one of the nicest. I mean, you're like kittens and puppies. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, just as nice as can be, as sweet as can be. Where does this darkness come from? Where you write stories that are so suspenseful and chilling, where does that come from? Yeah, I mean, I think that I mean, probably like people write writers write crime fiction for the same people for the same reason that people read crime fiction, right? Because on, it's on it's on the page where you know I metabolize darkness. So I can I can live in the light, but it's the, this is the place where I answer all my questions, all the questions that I have about people, and usually that question is, you know, what's wrong with you? <laughs> 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 and so I spend a lot of time, and I think even as a kid, you know, I you know, I had a pretty a pretty happy childhood, you know, only like the most banal dysfunction in my in my family, <laughs> um, but you know, I did have some pretty dark experiences in my town as I was growing up, a, a young girl that I um, I knew what played in the orchestra, who played the violin. She was abducted and murdered when I was 15 years old. And it was like this very small town that uh, we lived in. And it was like the place where you move your family from the city, right? It's like a place where nothing bad ever happens. And then this horrific thing happened. And it just was like sort of for me, like I felt like my life was one thing before that and then another thing after that. And 
there, I had a lot of questions, you know, like it just seemed so it was, we were as teenagers, not really protected from that. And everything kind of, um, you know, played out in front of us. And I had a lot of questions about why people do the things that they do and why this girl and why this moment and how, how does something like this happen? But nobody really wanted to answer those questions. Like they don't want a 15 year old girl to ask the questions and nobody wants to answer and nobody has the answers. And so I sort of found myself, you know, writing, you know, writing my way to answers. And a lot of it was very dark. And I just kind of always had that type of <clears throat> inquiry. Is it, is it common for you to, to take an event in real life and use that for your fiction? Um, it is in a, like a very elliptical sense. Like there, so that, that particular story um, was something that kind of stayed with me. And it tried to work its way into things and it tried to expand itself into a novel in um, maybe like a couple, a couple times, like three or four times, like a short story it almost was, and then maybe it was almost a novel, but it never really, it never really gelled. And then um, when I was writing Fragile, uh, because of the way I write, um, I was like about 25% into the book. And when I was like, oh, okay, here it is. Right, this is the place where the story gets told. Not the retelling of that story, but my piece of the story that I could bring forward, you know, with me. I didn't want to, you know, it's not a retelling. I didn't want to cause anybody any more pain than had already been caused by, like, you know, if, or to exploit anybody. But I had a piece of it that was mine that I brought forward, and so that is that was the way that it kind of evolved on onto the page. And things like that often happen. Like, so something, you know, like the new couple of 5B, for example, um, which will be out in March, was inspired by a building that my um, my aunt lived in when I was a kid. And it's like sort of an iconic building for me. And I sort of carried that piece with me. And then it sort of found its way onto the page. So like with Fragile, like I felt like when I actually was able to write the story, it was almost as if, I needed to be a better writer. I needed to be older. I needed to have like eight books under my belt. I needed to be a mother. I needed to be a wife in order to have a perspective on that story that I didn't have when I was 15 or 18 or 25. And so I feel like things find their way onto the page when, you know, when I'm ready for them to, to do them justice. So did, so did you get married and have a child so that you could write this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I am a writer. <laughs> Everything is in service for that. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> uh, so do you see yourself in, in Madeline, the, uh, the heroine of this book? Do I see I guess I see myself a little bit in all of my characters. I mean, that's kind of like, you know, they're all like little slivers of my of my subconscious in some respect, but I always feel that they are, that they just sort of arrive on the page. Like, you know, they definitely feel real to me in, in the writing. It's not a, a mirror of me in any sense, but you know, I, there's a little bit of her, in her voice, there's a little bit, I think of my voice. There's some of her thoughts and opinions and her, you know, her ideas about Christmas and whatnot might be, <laughs> <laughs> might be, might be close, might be close to, well, I think her right. ideas of Christmas seem a little bit more cheerful yeah. than uh, <laughs> than yours, evidently. Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, you asked me when you asked me if I ever wanted to write a Christmas novel. I, I have always wanted to write a Christmas novel, but only because, you know, I love like a shiny, glittery thing um, so that I could just smash out of my eyes and see what's inside because there's always a shadow. And that's what interests me. It's the shadow that I'm curious about. So I'm going to, you know, I always think of myself as kind of like a, like a spelunker, you know, like I shimmy myself into the, the dark spaces of the human psyche just because I'm curious. Yeah, I, had, I didn't exactly know what I was getting when, when, I, <laughs> when I suggested No, you this. didn't. No, you I, thought I, it was going to be cozy. I, 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 yeah, maybe not, maybe not cozy. That's, that's strong. But that's strong. It's but a this strong is, word. This is pretty dark. And, uh, yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. It was darker than I thought it was going to be. I mean, there were certain, yeah, there were certain, there were certain moments I was like, Whoa. wow, that's dark. <laughs> 
but but it, it's so good. I mean, it really is so good that uh, that you know I wasn't depressed for a month after. <laughs> I got over it after about a week or so. Well, there is some like I mean, it is dark, but there it is a little bit sweet. Yeah, and yeah, a little bit, and like 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 a piece of like really dark chocolate, right? Like it's still it's still chocolate. <laughs> no, it's nothing like chocolate. Not even close. No, you're right. <laughs> so, did you like writing in the novella form? Oh yeah, I writing a, a, yeah. a shorter, a long, long short story or a really short novel. Yeah, I do. Like, so I, I mean, I think. Well, probably most writers, like young writers, you know, start to experiment with short fiction, right? I mean, that was certainly true for me. You know, like I wrote a lot of short fiction and like terrible poetry and like all the stuff that you that you do when you're a kid. And I, but I started my first novel when I was 19 years old. And once I like found my voice, you know, as a novelist, I didn't really visit short fiction that often until pretty recently. And um, so I started writing short stories a few years ago, doing them fairly regularly. I did a novella and then this novella, and I just felt, you know, I just love the intensity of the form. Mm -hmm. You know, I love that it's like this, you know, kind of burst of creative energy. It's like, it's like a space, it's like a little vacation that you take mm -hmm. from your novel, you know, which is like a long, a long journey, you know, a year or more sometimes, and it's like, you know, it's good days and bad days and, you know, surprises and all that. And the novella just felt like a very intense, and the short fiction in general just feels like a very intense burst of energy for me. Like I have this, you know, like I already had an idea kind of kicking around with my head when you suggested um, a Christmas in a you did uh, an idea, but was it a Christmas idea no. connected to Christmas? In any way? No, 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 <laughs> no, it is. It is a dark idea that is now connected to Christmas. <laughs> well, you wrote a very nice short story for for the bookshop, our, that's right. Our Biblio Mystery, yeah, which is really great. Uh, I appreciated that when you when you yeah. wrote it. Yeah, I so love you, that. You're good at the short form, Thank good you. at the middle form, and, and obviously very good at the at the long form. So next is what, like a trilogy? You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I've always like sort of, I've never really, I mean, I have books that are connected, like the books that are set in the hollows are all kind of connected by place and character, like there are characters that kind of repeat, and I have a couple of books. My early, my early stories are a series, and then I have a couple of other books that are connected, but I've never really done like, you know, a trilogy or something yeah. like three, like have a vision a story in those big pieces, but who knows? Are you going to use any of the characters from this uh, from this book again? Uh, I, I think so. I think Har I think Harley's going to come. Harley, over, Harley Granger, oh, cool. my true crime podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's yeah. a really great character. Yeah, I enjoyed him. I mean, he's not he he's you know he's damaged. Which is my favorite kind of hero. <laughs> Sorry, <honey. laughs> And you know he's, but he has a lot of layers. I don't think he's irredeemable. That you know there are some, you know, hint that he might be slightly unethical. But I think you know, I think he's, I think he has um, a solid heart. So I'm interested to see how he evolves on the page and what he what he is. Is he unethical? Is he well, you know, this is a character who is forcing Maddie to go back into her, her past, yeah. who and who really doesn't want to, because it took her a long time to get past the horrors of that night, and uh, and he's pushing it, uh, and and she's saying, I don't want to do it, I don't want to talk to you. Her best friend Badger is mm -hmm. saying, Don't talk to him, don't talk to him. He'll right. go away, he'll go away, uh, and he keeps pushing it. Yeah. So I don't know if he's unethical, but I don't think he's uh, kind. No, no, definitely not. Um, I mean, I think he has the potential to eventually sort of grow up and be kinder, but at the moment he's very focused on his needs and his wants, and so he's a he's like sort of a failed fiction writer. So he's he's been out, you know, he's had a few novels out, and um, the you know we can't get published again, and his friend gets laid off from. From a, a, a national radio show and so they get together in a bar and they decide that they are going to start a podcast together and then he kind of finds that he's able to bring 
his, you know, his ability to weave story and to, um, you know, to create character, he's, he's able to bring it to the form of the podcast. And so that he winds up doing really well with podcasting because he has this sense of storytelling. And, and so he turns it and then he becomes very, very successful. So he's a podcaster and um, also an author, a nonfiction author. And he's actually had some success in terms of, you know, getting cases reopened and, you know, finding truths that had otherwise been hidden. So he's got like some, some layers to him, but he's, you know, he's definitely, I mean, for me like that, the podcast and his character was part of, you know, a lot of questioning that I do. I mean, I think probably all of us listen to a lot of crime podcasts and stuff like that. I mean, it's not, it's like sort of novelist catnip, right? To like listen to that long form journalism. Um, but like, you know, there are some questions about it in terms of not just ethics, but also exploitation and how much pain people are being caused and whether the retelling of the story in a, in a way that is made compelling for listeners or for readers is, you know, in some ways, like almost fictionalizing actual events that cause people a lot of pain. And so I, I do do a lot of thinking about that when I listen to podcasts because, you know, it seems like fiction, you know, and you, there's almost this, you know, there's this like, you know, this gripping suspense to them and they're written that way, but it, these are real lives, real people and horrible things happen to them. And so it's like, what is the line between telling a story for entertainment and, you know, sort of diving into the lives of people that, you know, that have already suffered and are, are deeply traumatized, like Maddie. So Maddie has a lot of trauma and he doesn't really care about that. He just cares about the story. Yeah, <clears throat> you anticipated my question. I, I was going to ask if you listen to, if you listen to podcasts. Yeah. Uh, and when you do, does that inspire uh, books that you're writing or, or elements in those books? Yeah, I mean, I think that you know, sort of the writer first and foremost is an observer. You know, we're always like taking in information. You know, not just from news stories, but from you know everything that we read and our conversations and if we're present and, and absorbing detail, which hopefully we are and we should be, then yeah, I think a lot of that stuff does wind up on the page. But I've not ever like lifted an actual crime from the headlines and then tried to write about it. Like that for me is not interesting. You know, like it's not like I don't want to tell a story that's already been told or retell a story that's already been told. And for me, it's all about everything begins and ends with character voice. Like, so if I didn't have Maddie's voice, I wouldn't have a book. Like I couldn't, I, there's no, it's not that there's a plot first and the characters get inserted. It's that there's a char there are characters and the plot evolves through their action on the page. That's how it works for me. And do they, do they then run the plot? Do they go and do things that you didn't know that they were gonna do as you're writing the book? Maybe in the first draft. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i did experience it that way and i know that there's like a lot of conversation online about like you know that you know characters aren't real or characters are real for me they're real on the page and if they're not then i can't be involved with them and then if i'm not involved with them then i don't feel like my readers can be involved with them either but for me they're real and what and what they're feeling uh, you know is always going to be drawn from my research you know i spend a lot of time researching um psychology trauma you know even anatomy you know like to understand like the human being right like the mind the body all of it and then my observations and then myself you know my own feelings and how i respond to things and you know the lives of you know people who are close to me you know i you know i'm always like kind of in observation mode and that just sort of finds its way onto the onto the page <laughs> Yeah. Sorry, okay. I think that's the yeah. That means Ocean got her Uber Easel. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I'm busy right now. I'm talking to 25 Wait, people. Wait, it's okay. I'm yeah. FaceTime. <laughs> so uh, this idea of characters coming to life for you, uh, yeah. as they do, and somehow bring it. Nobody wants to hear my story. They want to hear you. But I have to say this very quickly. Yeah. Elmore Leonard, when he wrote his books, had, he had never started with a plot. He had no idea what he was going to write. Right. And so he created these characters. And I remember one phone call, he, he called and said, oh, I, don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. I said, what, what? He said, I'm page 130. And my, my guy got killed last night. 
That's what he means. The, the whole book has been around this guy at the center, and he got shot last night. <laughs> and I'm trying because he often, often used real life characters and real life names. Right. John Pump. And I said, "You mean the real life guy?" He said, "Yeah, you know the, yeah, the, the real guy. life guy in the book." <laughs> and I well, said, yeah. "Can you just rewrite that chapter?" He said, "What are you talking about?" No, my, he's dead. My guy <laughs> So that's a little maybe extreme for what you do. Yeah, but I do understand that. I mean, yeah. I do, and I feel like you understand if it. you can't get into if you can't get into that headspace with it, like I don't know how you can create an authentic piece of fiction. Like I mean, even if it's just you know, even if it's just like you know, and it is right. It's like a hundred thousand word, in most cases, you know, just something that you made up. It's a lie, right? But you have to live the lie, <laughs> right? Like if you were telling lies. You authentically, you would have to believe those lies, right? <laughs> Especially if they were so elaborate. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> how could you keep it all? How could you keep it all together? <laughs> it has to be real, right? Because it's like you know, a lot, a lot of times my my books will have multiple characters. Like sometimes it's just one person, and it's a very intense, like first person, present tense way of telling the story. And it's one person, and it's their story. Maybe there's a few other pieces but it's just that one person in some places and some stories are like almost mosaics for me you know you have these individual characters and they all have their piece and once they're linked together then that's the picture each piece has their you know their shade or their you and then when they're together then that's you know that's the picture of the novel and people will say like Oh, you know how? Do, don't you get them confused? And I'm like, <laughs> get them confused. Like, do you confuse your aunt, with your sister, <laughs> with your best friend, with your husband? Like, that's not. There, it's not. Well, Joe Biden does, but that's. Well, right. <laughs> <laughs> right, but that's how real they are to me. Like, they're real. So it's not like I'm, you know, I'm following their story through the narrative. So they're they have to be real to me in some sense, even though you know, of course. It's uh, critics uh, used to uh, give Dorothy Sayers a hard time because uh, it was clear to critics that she had fallen in love with Peter Whimsy. <laughs> <laughs> that, right. that she absolutely yeah. Have you fallen in love with some of your characters? Not necessarily in this book, but just in your in your opera? I mean, I think in falling in love, maybe not so much, but I have people that are very attached to you. So like Ian Payne in, in Crazy Love You is a, gra a like a very like sort of messed up addicted graphic novelist, mm -hmm. and I just really enjoyed my my time with him. He had a lot going on, but I still have a tender place in my heart for him. Jones Cooper is a character that turns up again and again. He's the detective that sort of when he showed up in Fragile, I like just didn't think that much of him. I thought he was just the husband. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just the husband and then he wound up having this you know he wound up having this role in the book and then when the book was over i left him in this really terrible place and i was like and i found myself like worried about him like oh my god what's gonna happen to him now <laughs> and so i had to write another, write another book <laughs> <laughs> which i did and that was dark as my old friend so there are people and then he pops up a lot like he shows up in books when i didn't expect him so he's somebody that, you know, he's like a really old school um, detective. He's married to uh, Maggie Cooper, who is a, uh, a psychologist. And he he shows up when I need order, mm -hmm. right? When I need something, I need, uh, when I need like the old school, you know, detective type guy to do the thing that needs to get done. <laughs> he's like the guy who you call to walk your dog or check on your house and you're, he's like that guy. So he shows up. Uh, as it happens, we, we have quite a few authors yeah, in the room yeah, tonight. Right. <laughs> so maybe they understand this. <laughs> there are some of us who have no idea some what they're talking about. Some of them do about. understand. Some of them are like, I don't write that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's open it to any of you who may have questions for Lisa. Did you just raise your hand? No. Your <laughs> 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 <That's> <laughs> <way> <laughs> Anybody? No questions? Everything, everything that you ever wanted to know? Well, they, they, they all talk to me a lot. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> hey. Hey. Lisa, you always say that you don't know where it's going, but have you ever written a book where all of a sudden you realize by the fourth chapter you did know where it's going? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that there's always like that. There's like, there's this idea that your subconscious knows the story better than you do. Like, I feel like it's there and I'm just trying to find it. You know, like that's kind of how I always experience it. And it's like, you know, I I have a sense of where the story is going, how it, how it's going to evolve. I just can't specifically say well, what that is on any given day. And there's no way for me to extrapolate it out. Like, I can't go, okay, um, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. Like, I have to be on the page writing in order to, to, find, to find the story. But I do think that, like, so certain kinds of things will happen where something will happen on the page and I don't really understand it, right? And I'm just like, hmm, okay, what is that? <laughs> but I know myself well enough to know that, um, like, 50 pages down the road, I'm going to be like, oh, that was why. And so I, I have, like, come to trust my process in that way. And I think it's largely just because, you know, I've just been reading all my life. You know, I've just, I feel like in some sense, I've, like, internalized the form of the novel, you know. And so it's in there, but it's like, I just feel like I'm finding my way to it every time. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. oh, sure. Yeah. That's a different brain. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it is. It's a, the reading brain and the writing brain are different brains. Yeah, the writing brain and the fear brain are different brains. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's all sorts of different brains in there. <laughs> but yeah, I feel like writing is kind of part of my, I mean, reading is kind of part of my job. You know, I, to, to, you know, to support my, you know, fellow authors and to, you know, be current with what's going on in the industry and all of that like it's it's part of my job to kind of a lot of a lot of the mystery writers that i know will not read mysteries mm -hmm. when they're mm -hmm. when they're in the process of writing they'll read non-fiction yeah but i do don't... read a lot of non-fiction but i i do still read within a genre even when when i'm writing yeah absolutely yeah another question have you ever started writing a character and then realized that, that character was going nowhere and then just gotten rid of them that usually happens in editorial. You know, they <laughs> that usually happens. That usually happens. Like I'm very attached to my characters, even when I know that they don't really, they don't really belong. But I think my editor and I were just laughing about this yesterday because we we had a meeting where there was a in 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 the uh, in secluded cabin there was a character who had a relationship to one of the characters, and I was like very into this character, and I kind of knew that. He didn't really belong, but you know, she and I, I called him uh, for some reason, old Bob. That was the same. <laughs> <laughs> and so she was like, "You need to tell him about What? No. She was like, like, "What? No." But and then when I lifted him out, it was like it changed nothing. So I, <laughs> so I knew he really did need to go. But I just feel I still feel bad for him. I think I think he's gonna show up somewhere. <laughs> you can't waste him. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna start putting him to every book. <laughs> so that's like kind of like our private joke. She's like, remember old mom? <laughs> I'm going to follow up on Kate because yeah. I'm curious. So, um, so your whole first draft, are you finding the plot and discovering the plot? And then in the next, in future drafts, you kind of are restructuring or refining? I mean, I don't do a ton of restructuring. When we get there, like because of the way I write, it's very linear. Like it, it, it evolves for me on the page like it does for the reader. So it's not like I'm like, oh, I'm going to write this piece. And oh, I'm inspired to write this piece. And I don't know where it fits. Like, it's not like jigsaw puzzle type situation. So structurally, um, it's probably about nine. It's probably about 90% where it needs to be when I'm done. But it's like, you know, like any first draft, you know, you're so involved in it. You're there for a year. You're right. I, I'm rewriting and reading while I'm writing, like the same thing. So like, and then once I'm done with that first draft, I start reading at page one, and then I'm just reading, and then I, so then I can see things that I didn't, couldn't see why I was writing, like, oh, this, you know, this doesn't work, and this is a, a hole, and whatever, and then there's an editorial process, at least two or three drafts before I ever turn it in, and then the editorial process after that is, like, where your editor's, like, <laughs> <laughs> like what? what was that <laughs> and then 
you that's where I, I and I actually enjoy the editorial process. Like I feel like that the that like when I turn my book in, like I know that it's literally the best that I can do. <laughs> Not that it's the best, it's the best that I can do. <laughs> and that, you know, the next step is where it goes from being the best that I could do to being the best that it can that it can be. And I think when you really trust your editor or you trust your team, then you know everybody's working towards the same goals and you can feel when those changes or those, you know, those suggestions are like, oh, right, yeah, right, absolutely. So that's kind of that. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of rewriting, but restructuring, not so much because, you know, like for me, it's like, you know, it's an organic process. So there's always an ebb and a flow. So like there's these days where you can't, you know, you can't stop it. You can't stop it from coming. And those are great days. And then there are the days where you're like, Wow, I have never written a book before. And I'm not gonna be able to write this one. So I'm just gonna hang it up. But then like you know, you know that you can do certain things, right? Like you can't go on social media, you can't answer email, but you can bake a cake or you can go for a walk or you can like throw the ball for your dog or like whatever it is, and then then I hear well, I'll hear the next piece or I'll see it or whatever and then I'll know and like extra, you know, I'll go to the gym, whatever it is that like is physical but mindless and kind of like takes me to the next step. So that's how it evolves for me. So you know, it's not there's generally not a ton of restructure, but there's a lot of writing and rewriting. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Have you ever had an idea for a book and then realized it was too dark? <laughs> um, I, no. I can answer for Lisa. No. <laughs> I mean, no. I mean, I've had a lot of things that I, I, there are a lot of places where I thought I would never go and mm -hmm. I just wind up going there because I went there and so I'm there. And so, I'm there. <laughs> and so I just have to figure it out. But I mean, like, what, like, you know, what would be like too dark? <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is a hot sidebar. <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, I feel like, you know, like that's just kind of, I've always had that kind of imagination, like that kind of dark and twisted imagination. So if I'm there, you know, there, there's a, there's a reason for it, you know, and uh, I'm going to, I'm going to stay there. You know? <clears throat> okay, let's have one more and then we'll, we'll wind it down. Let's wind it down right now. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. And I did. A, I, I was too quick. I was too eager to uh, introduce Lisa. I should have said there is a bar. There's stuff at the bar. If you would like to have a glass of wine or a beer or a soft drink or water or something, there's a restroom back there if you need it. Um, 